All right, Ling 201, I've got one last brief phonology lecture to give to you on phonological rules. Uh, and once we're done with this, I think you have everything you need to know for the homework, except I am still going to make another video about the um, uh, distinctive features practice exercises. So you get a good handle on how to um, work with distinctive features uh, in writing up phonological rules. But that will follow this uh, particular lecture. Uh, and then I'm also going to post um, another set of practice exercises for syllable structure too, but I don't want to dally too much. You just need to know what you need to know for phonological rules. So let's get into it. Um, okay, so one common phonological process we've seen so far is assimilation, <clears throat> which is where one sound becomes like another in its environment. Uh, and there's a lot of examples of this in the languages throughout the world. And we've seen a couple. Uh, one distinction you can make here, though, is that uh, there can be total assimilation versus partial assimilation. Um, in English, we see examples of partial assimilation where only one part or one feature of a target sound changes. Uh, we've seen these a fair amount now, but um, say if you create the word improbable in English, you have this um, prefix in, which attaches to probable. So the in ends in an, an al ends in an alveolar nasal uh, N, and then the probable uh, root begins with a bilabial stop P. So you ditch the alveolar place of articulation for the N and you um, change it to a bilabial place of articulation to match the bilabial stop, which follows it. So improbable is how we say that particular word. Um, that's place assimilation only. It's a form of partial assimilation. We saw a total assimilation a while back when we we're looking at the Arabic sun and moon letters. Uh, so in this case, we have the entire target sound changing to match another sound in its, in its environment. And I can't really talk today, but we'll make it through this somehow. Uh, so al, um, when it attaches to da, um, the L at the end of Al becomes a D to match the D at the beginning of the, the root or the word house. Okay, that's total assimilation. It can happen both ways. That's just how you describe it. Uh, okay, so assimilation processes can also affect sounds in different directions. We talked about this um, kind of along the way um, a couple of lectures ago, but you have regressive assimilation, like an improbable, which is where features spread backward in time. So in this case, the um, place of articulation of the P sort of moves backwards to affect the sound that happens uh, or comes before it in the utterance improbable. So it changes the place of articulation of the prefix. Uh, you can also have progressive assimilation. This works in English as well. So we talked about voicing assimilation for the English plural marker. Um, we have this suffix S or maybe Z, uh, which we attach to the end of nouns to make them plural. Uh, and it takes on the voicing uh, or phonation type voicing quality of the sound that ends the root word. So cat ends in a voiceless T. So the um, plural suffix is going to be voiceless there. Cats, it's an S for dogs. <clears throat> g ends in, uh, or dog ends in a voiced g, and therefore the uh, plural suffix is going to be the voiced form, the z form of um, the suffix dogs. Uh, so basically what's happening there is that the voicing um, specification is moving later on in time to affect the sounds that come after the root rather than before it. That's progressive assimilation rather than regressive assimilation. Okay, uh, the phonetic shape of the plural marker in English also depends on another phonological rule, and we've seen this as well. So we looked at uh, words like matches or judges or hoses or passes, and we know now that these things, um, these words all end in strident consonants. And because of that, we're adding a strident um, suffix to make the plural uh, for all of them. And what happens before we get there is that um, there's an insertion rule that um, inserts a short vowel I in between the two strident consonants. So insertion is just a general term for what happens in phonology where you have some, nothing turning into something in some environment. So there was no I here before. It's not part of the root. Uh, it's just part of the phonology that helps us kind of separate these sounds so that they're easier to either hear or say. Um, so in this particular case, we have I insertion, and I have this kind of null set operator, uh, zero with a line straight through it, going to I when it occurs between two stridents, like we would get for match if we didn't have an I there. Um, that's just insertion. Another name for this, um, if you want to use it, is epenthesis. Um, so go for that if you'd like to. Uh, insertion might be a little easier to remember. Uh, the opposite of uh, insertion is deletion. It's not 
desertion. Uh, so insertion, nothing goes to something. Deletion, something goes to nothing in some environment. And this happens a lot, especially in casual speech in English. So um, take the word fifth. It's not always easy to say fifth with those two fricatives next to each other at the end of the words. Sometimes you might say fifth. I plead the fifth. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Um, some other examples, uh, say the word probably. If you say it quickly, you might just say probably. Uh, or suppose, you might delete the little schwa here in between the S and the P and just say suppose, I suppose. Um, this is, these are all examples of deletion. Um, we didn't talk a whole lot um, about this or get a chance to talk about it, but uh, there are certain dialects of English which drop R's in certain cases. So British English in particular uh, drops R's like the word hard. They would not say R there, they'd say hard. Um, that's a form of deletion. Uh, in some sense, we saw an example of that too when we looked at Hawaiian Creole English or just Hawaiian Creole, uh, which also drops R's like that, uh, changes them into different vowels, and then also deletes final consonants in consonant clusters, uh, in coda clusters, that is. So paint, hopefully we know by now that paint is a one-syllable word and the coda consists of N and T in um, English. In Hawaiian Creole, you drop that final um, stop and just say pain. Uh, or old, you also drop the alveolar stop and just say old. That's another example of deletion. Simplifying the coda clusters a little bit. Okay, uh, so insertion and deletion are kind of opposites. And there's also an opposite to assimilation, which is called dissimilation. So this is where you have a change uh, be made to a sound that makes it less similar to a sound in its environment. Uh, so here's an example. This doesn't happen um, in any regular way from in um, English, but uh, it does in Greek. So epta means uh, seven, or at least that's the underlying form, the phonemic form. When you actually produce it in Greek, you say epta. So what you have here underlyingly is you have two stops, a P and a T right after each other. And then you change the first P, the first stop to an F. So it goes from being a minus continuant or a stop sound to being a plus continuant sound when it's right in the neighborhood of another minus continuant sound. Um, yeah, so that's dissimilation, just two things becoming less similar to each other. Uh, in casual speech in English, you can get something like this, not in, not in fifth, but maybe you say the word sixth, which has even more uh, consonants jammed up against each other in the coda there. Um, so sixth, uh, if you say it where you're still trying to uh, keep all the phonemes in there, you might say sixth. Uh, maybe you do, maybe you don't. But in this case, if you do, uh, what you have here at the end are two fricatives right next to each other, two continuing things again. Um, and the second one becomes uh, minus continuous. So it's sort of the opposite of the Greek pattern, but you lose the frication in the theta and it becomes an alveolar stop T. There's also a small place of articulation change happening there, but I uh, don't want to dwell on that um, too much. Basically, a plus continuum becoming minus continuum. Uh, yeah, um, and also in that case, it would be, um, yeah, uh, I'm not gonna <laughs> worry about the posteriority of that. Uh, these particular rules exhibit manner dissimilation, uh, but you can get this uh, in any sort of um, way that you imagine it. So you might get voicing dissimilation, so on and so forth. But it's not nearly as common to see dissimilation in phonology as it is to see assimilation in phonology, so it's relatively rare throughout the world, uh, which is kind of why I had to go to another language to find it. Uh, another process, which is quite rare but interesting, is metathesis, where the order of two segments is changed. So I've got an example from in um, a language from the Pacific Islands that's called Leti. Uh, so in Leti, there's a sequence, uh, you can say Danat Kviali, and I'm sorry, I don't have the gloss here. I don't know exactly what this means, but I do know that uh, when you have this Danat being added to a Kviali, the T and the K would end up one, uh, right next to each other if you said it the way it is um, in the phonemic representation. So to avoid that, for whatever reason, they actually say Danta Kviali. Uh, so the A and the T, um, or the A and the T change positions here so that the T and the K are separated from each other. Um, we get this uh, in a variety of English dialects. Um, sometimes uh, you might hear someone say, instead of ask, they might say ax, where the S and the K change, change positions. Um, in kid speech, you might get something like um, paschetti for spaghetti. Um, 
bit of a stretch to call it metathesis. The S might, you might interpret it as the S moving all the way from the beginning to right before the velar stop here to make it kind of voiceless, so Paschetti. Uh, but it's changing the order of these segments in that particular case. Um, in adult speech, uh, we have a word like comfortable, which I don't think anybody actually says is comfortable. Um, my wife finds that hard to believe, but it's true. Normally people will say comfortable. Um, so if you look closely here um, in the sort of underlying representation, the way you'd expect it to be based on how the morphemes are normally pronounced, uh, comfort, the R comes before the T. Um, in this case, though, comfortable, um, they change the position. So the R becomes a syllabic R uh, and the T becomes comes before it. So comfortable to comfortable. Yeah, kind of funny when you think about it, but just another example of metathesis. Uh, and another place where you find metathesis a lot is in um, speech errors. So a lot of times when people say things they're not meaning to say, uh, they come out just in sort of the opposite order they expected to, uh, for whatever reason. There's not a lot of knowledge in the science behind that, but people have observed that it happens quite a bit. Um, yeah. So lastly, I'll mention reduction. Uh, so this doesn't necessarily have like a, another opposite in a pair in terms of these phonological rule sets. But what happens in reduction is that ph phonemic contrasts get lost in particular phonetic environments. Uh, so this happens in English. Uh, in unstressed syllables, a lot of vowels will reduce to schwa. And sometimes this happens because stress shifts because you're adding on um, prefixes or suffixes and then uh, stress wants to shift to be either closer to the end of the word or further away, whatever that case may be. Uh, we've got a nice couple of examples here from place names that we might be familiar with. So unfortunately, we didn't get a uh, chance to talk about how to produce or uh, pronounce or transcribe uh, the name of the city we live in. But I say it Calgary with three syllables. Um, and the first one is stressed. The second syllable has a schwa in it. I know a lot of people who are from Calgary uh, actually say it Calgary with two syllables and that um, schwa gets um, eliminated altogether. But that's even just a further form of what I'm talking about here in terms of vowel reduction. Because when I stress, uh, when I shift the stress um, and talk about somebody who lives in Calgary or is from Calgary, I will say a Calgarian. So this vowel, which we write with an A, um, but uh, we actually say with a schwa in normal circumstances, if you're like me, um, that becomes an epsilon. So it kind of gets upgraded uh, in this form of the word because um, stress shifts to be on it now. Uh, so that means that we're kind of reducing it in the normal um, pronunciation of the word. And you're really reducing it, you're deleting it in the case of Calgary. Uh, and there are some people I know as well, the third pronunciation of the name of the city is Calgary. Uh, in that case, it's not reduced at all. Um, and in my experience, that pronunciation typically comes from um, sort of people who come from uh, rural uh, or small towns in Alberta or say BC. Um, Calgary is uh, the two syllable pronunciation is from people who are Calgary natives. And Calgary, uh, my pronunciation is from people who uh, are from neither of the above, neither small towns in Alberta or in Calgary itself. Um, another example you can think of is Canada. Uh, so I think everybody says Canada, Canada. Uh, and then also if you talk about somebody from Canada, you're talking about a Canadian. Uh, so in this case, we have, um, once we add the, um, the N, e -N aff affix to it um, to talk about a person who's from the location, stress shifts to be on this syllable here, Canadian. So two things happen. One is that this vowel, which used to be an A, Canada, uh, changes into a schwa here, so that gets reduced. And we note as well that sort of um, the underlying representation of this is A, um, but uh, when we aren't stressing it in just the word Canada, it just becomes a schwa. So it's reduced kind of going in this direction. Uh, that's vowel reduction. And I think, yeah, um, there's a couple notes here on the end, but I'm not gonna talk about them because we don't have to worry about them uh, per se for this class. Um, you can read more about phonemic representations in the book if you want to. Uh, I'm not going to trouble, trouble you with them for now. Uh, and otherwise, that's all I'm going to say about um, phonological rule types for now. Uh, let me know if you have any questions, um, but hopefully that's clear enough. Okay, see you next time.